Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. I am Adam Guerin, class of 97, and president of Blake's Alumni Board. I'm honored to represent the Blake Alumni Board and the Office of Institutional Advancement, which sponsors these events known as Breakfast at Blake. One of the many things we share as Blake alumni is that we value excellence and leadership. Our speaker today, John De Niro, class of 98, embodies those traits. He is the recipient of the 2022 Outstanding Young Alumnus Award. Presenting him with this honor is Blake Head of School, Dr. Ann Stavney. Please join me in welcoming her. to everyone. It's great to see you all and see a, a very full room. I have the pleasure of presenting our 2022 Young Alumnus of the Year Award to John De Niro, class of 1998. John is an Associate Professor of Computer Science at the University of California, Berkeley, and he's also the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies in the UC Berkeley Division of Computing, Data Science, and Society. At UC Berkeley, uh, Professor De Niro teaches some of the largest college courses in the country. This semester, his introductory computer science course includes 1,650 students, and his introductory data science course has 1,950 students. This is the highest course enrollment in UC Berkeley history. John is also co-founder and chief scientist of LILT. It is a language translation software and services company. Prior to his current roles, he was a senior research scientist at Google, working primarily on Google Translate. John is author of the textbook, Composing Programs, and co-author of Computational and Inferential Thinking. His research focuses on natural language processing and computer science education. John's time at Blake began in the, uh, the seventh grade. As a student, he participated in the math team, the Blakers Dozen a cappella group, quiz bowl, science bowl, and cross country running. After Blake, he went on to graduate from Stanford and then earned a PhD in computer science from the University of California, Berkeley. John and his wife, Jessica, and their son, Ian, who is six, um, live in the Berkeley area. The Young Alumnus of the Year Award honors a member of our alumni community who has demonstrated outstanding leadership, achievement, and influence in their field and community. John, today we honor you with this citation. The Blake School recognizes John De Niro for outstanding contributions to the fields of computer science, data science, and education. For advances in language translation software that have ushered in a new era of global connection and collaboration. And for teaching and inspiring future generations of pioneering scientists and innovative thinkers. It is my pleasure, John, to present you with Blake's 2022 Young Alumnus of the Year Award, and congratulations. I should have been this nervous since my senior speech. Okay, uh, thank you all so much for coming today. I'm gonna to spend a minute just finding some slides and then we'll talk about computer science and data science. No quizzes, I promise. Okay, so.
Yeah, UC Berkeley is an interesting place. It's you know full of Nobel laureates and all of that. Uh, I'm a teaching professor there, which means I'm one of the few people who focuses almost exclusively on undergraduate education. Um, and you know, Blake has been preparing students for that experience for many, many years. So I thought maybe I'd talk a little bit about what I've seen happening there. Uh, and as you heard, I teach some large classes. Um, you know, there's the first day of class. The um, the course that has 1,900 students in it doesn't fit in this room, even though it's the largest lecture hall on campus. This is about 700 of them. There's another 700 that join via Zoom because that's become a thing since uh, the pandemic. And then we rerun the lecture at night in order to capture the last 700 or so. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that um, it's, it's uh, a little interesting to have that mixed format of people online. I know there's some people online here for this talk, so hi folks. Uh, before the pandemic, we would really just do everything in person at first, and so we used to use the concert hall for the first day of class. <laughs> this actually has about 1,900 seats, and um, yeah, so that's basically the pool of students that are all in one class, and I think a reasonable reaction to looking at a picture of this many people in the class is to say that this must be a scam. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Robbie, sorry if I took your quotation out of context slightly. Um, what's amazing about these courses in computer science and data science is that a lot of students take them by choice. They hear from their friends that it's interesting, and so they enroll for that reason. Uh, and the student reviews of how the courses go have actually improved as the courses got really big. So something must be going right. Um, my sense is that it takes a lot of work to figure out how to scale a course from something small to something large. So that's mostly what I spend my time on. And uh, what's worked is that a lot of the learning doesn't happen in a classroom setting. Instead, it's about designing experiences that students can work on in small groups at home uh, to work on projects and build things. Uh, and then give them some support to do that. And um, yeah, what the support looks like is making sure that there are in fact a lot of people involved in teaching. Uh, so this is a picture of my teaching assistants. There's a lot of those. And the way we organize this course is that yes, there's a big lecture, but really a lot of the learning happens in you know, 30 person classrooms and then in one-on-one -on -one interactions with the teaching assistants. There's also a similarly sized army of uh, tutors that teach the course. And the idea is that if you want to get involved in teaching as an undergraduate, you first take the course, and then you can tutor for the course, which means you have you know, groups of four that you're working with. And then if you do that well and you like it, then you can get your own group of 30 students that you're teaching. But you, at that point, have not only taken the course in some more advanced material, but you've also practiced teaching the course for a semester or two as a tutor, and that kind of builds people up to the point where they can uh, teach themselves. Uh, but this is something that I think has changed about the college experience, at least back from when I was in college, is that a lot of students are spending a lot of time teaching their peers. And so like these communication skills that we always talk about are so important, well it turns out we like get them to use those uh, while they're still in college uh, to basically take what they've learned and tell somebody else about it. So yeah, I mean it is a scam. It's a big pyramid scheme, but it's, <laughs> it's one in which everybody's sort of um, uh, learning together. So, I guess what I wanted to point out is that um, Blake and, and Berkeley are very different in terms of the size of the courses, but they actually share some things in common that, um, you know, I've tried to take some of my Blake experience and bring it to the, uh, to the university. One thing is, I think, a shared belief that we should set really high expectations for students and then support them to meet those expectations. Another is like make sure that people really understand the fundamentals of what they're learning well. Um, I, I felt like it was a big gift uh, from Blake to make sure that I like really understood mathematics before I showed it into college and I really knew how to write an essay. 
uh, and that kind of um, foundation is what we're after at the college level as well. Um, yeah, and so there are some commonalities between Blake and even a huge university like Berkeley. Here's another one. They both have a bear <laughs> as a mascot. Go Bears. Um, the, the UC Berkeley mascot is notorious for not actually looking like a bear. Uh, that's Oski the Bear. I was interviewing him for a kind of graduation skit. And uh, yeah, he doesn't look at all like a bear. So I guess Kelly got it right. Um, that uh, that the, even at a wonderful place like Berkeley, they didn't quite get the mascot right. Um, another thing that's in common is some of the students. So these are uh, current Berkeley students who went to Blake and they found me and, uh, and we hung out for a day. Alexander was in my class. Um, so I, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what is drawing students in so many large numbers to these courses by just telling you a little bit about what I've been working on while I was there. I was a graduate student at Berkeley as well, so I was, joined the university in 2005 as a PhD student, and I was teaching artificial intelligence, and basically the way we decided to do this was to teach students how to write programs that play Pac-Man automatically in different ways. Uh, this caught on, these projects are used at a uh, probably a hundred different uh, colleges and universities now. And uh, then I joined as a full-time professor and I basically was still into this idea that computer science was about video games. So um, there's a famous video game called Plants vs. Zombies and we built a clone called Ants vs. Zombies. Um, and yeah, so basically we had students go ahead and try to build some of these programs that they would interact with as children. Um, and that got a lot of students you know, interested in this. But I think it was only the first wave of the interest that we see now. Um, the other thing we experimented with was to create computer science projects that used data. So this was one about mapping all the restaurants near the UC Berkeley campus and figuring out which ones uh, students would like to go to. So I won't describe the visualization, but I'll just say that all of a sudden a project that was about using real world data instead of just a video game seemed to engage a whole group of students that weren't quite as interested in computer science, but now said like, oh, this is interesting. This is about using computing to do something in the world. Um, and we've been running with that ever since. So I think we launched this project in 2013. In 2015, we built a whole new course about using computing to learn about the world. Uh, and it took us in some really interesting directions. So here's an example of a project that we use in our introductory data science course. It's about jury selection in Alameda County, which contains Berkeley and Oakland. And the question is, are the juries, which are meant to be representative of the population, in fact representative of the population, and in what way? Um, and so one way that you could think about the composition of juries is, you know, what's the racial or ethnic background of the people on the jury panel? Um, so you can look up for the region, what are the ethnicity distributions? You can look up in the jury panel, what are the ethnicity distributions? And you see a difference. Uh, there's an underrepresentation of black and Hispanic people on jury panels in Alameda County. And then you can ask interesting questions like, is that just due to a sort of random chance? You know, people like get something in the mail and it's a random selection. And you can start to answer that question using computer simulation. This is kind of a classic statistics problem, but it's about the real world. And then you can ask, well, why else might this occur? And actually it turns out in this case, a lot of it is due to the way the data is collected as opposed to like a massive amount of systemic bias, I think. Uh, but you really get to investigate like what's going on in the world, but using computing as a primary tool. So that's what data science is in my mind, different than computer science, is that computer science is mostly a discipline about building software applications, and data science is mostly a discipline about understanding the world. It's just they both use computers as their tool to do it. Uh, and this has brought in a whole group of students who weren't so sure about computing. Like they knew that it was important and that there were jobs and stuff like that, but they didn't know why it mattered to them. And now they could see, oh, it's a mechanism for studying the world and perhaps making a difference, and that got people really engaged. It also got the faculty at Berkeley really engaged. Each little box here is a different course that some other faculty member designed. 
based on, like as a follow-on course to our intro data science course. So people from the legal studies, uh, from the law school built a legal studies course about how data interacts with the law. And some neuroscientist built a course and some public health professor built a course because they all saw that if students could use computing to understand the world, then they should do it for my discipline too. And that meant that the university kind of came together around this idea of uh, using data science to understand the world. Of course, not everybody, but, uh, but it turned into kind of a university-wide operation. And then, you know, many years went by. I'll talk about what happened at the end of this era in a little bit. Okay, I'm not too far over time. I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so. What is it about these um, courses that gets people excited? I think two things. One is that um, computer science and data science are both about problem solving as opposed to just memorizing or learning knowledge that's already been accumulated. And that means students get to kind of use what they know really early on. I think that's a small part of it. But the bigger part of it is that they see connections with the social problems they care about and what they're learning about the technology. So uh, students who are like, you know, from a public health background or are interested in psychology think, oh yeah, like if I learn some data science, then I can make progress on those problems. Uh, and they also see, you know, real world problems like climate change and inequality. And they think, oh, maybe computing and technology is going to be relevant to that. Um, one thing that has surprised me is that we've seen a lot of organic growth in our ethics and social implications courses. I teach some of those as well. And it used to be that you had to just require ethics because otherwise nobody would show up. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, you should still require ethics, I think, but um, even students who aren't required to take it often are taking courses like the social implication of computing or the ethics of data because they're really interested in understanding how technology is changing the world. Um, so I think that's a lot of what's motivating um, this uh, interest and, you know, how has the interest grown? Uh, these are the two intro courses that I teach, so mostly first year students. Um, I started teaching part-time in 2011, full-time in 2014, and the computer science course was the biggest course on campus called CS61A. Uh, it's now plateaued. It's actually shrinking. And what's happened instead is that this data science course, which also teaches people to program but for a different purpose, has become the most popular course on campus and grew much faster. Um, and I think that that growth is very much fueled by the fact that uh, it's immediately obvious to those students that what they're learning is relevant to the world problems they care about, I think. Uh, also, if you take these courses, then you can get a job. Um, <laughs> so uh, when we started building a data science course, students asked us what's next. And we had to build another data science course and a whole kind of major and a minor at this point. Um, which was a massive collaborative effort. You know, I uh, helped get things going by building a first course, and I've helped to like uh, uh, guide people in through the process. But you know, it, it takes a whole faculty in order to build a whole program. But that has now happened. So ever since we started building and teaching these large introductory courses, that's led to some kind of organizational shift at the university level, where now uh, this is the graduation ceremony for the data science. Uh, major, which didn't exist four years ago, and is now the third most popular major on campus with you know, 600 students a year graduating. Uh, computer science is the most popular, then economics, then data science, then electrical engineering and computer science, so that's another computing major. So three out of the top four at Berkeley are uh, computing majors and account for a large fraction of the total undergraduates. I'm, I'm there. I get the MC of the show. It was really fun. <laughs> um, the wonderful thing about expansion is that it's allowed us to include new groups of people that wouldn't otherwise uh, participate in computing. So uh, what I've been doing, I think, over the last five years is trying to make sure that these programs are inviting and supportive for people who 
don't have a lot of prior background in computing or didn't see themselves working in computing before. Uh, and it's really been transformational. So here we see year by year the number of graduates and computing degrees at Berkeley from what have historically been underrepresented groups. So, um, you know, computer science was male dominated forever. It still is, uh, but the number of female graduates has tripled in the last five years. Uh, there's also been a shortage of people from undergraduate racial and ethnic backgrounds um, in the field. And that's growing quickly, although starting at a much smaller base. Um, and so, yeah, part of what gets me excited about doing things at a large scale is making sure that that means that more people from more diverse backgrounds can be included and participate. <laughs> okay, so I, uh, I chose to spend a lot of time on teaching. Um, this was a transition in my life. I um, was sort of trained as a computer science researcher and um, I still do some computer science research, but it's, it's more of a side gig because uh, a lot of my time is spent teaching. I figured I'd give you like a three minute summary of what my research is about in case that's interesting to you. Uh, I started out working on Google Translate right after I finished my PhD, and this is basically what I studied, is how to translate from one language to another. Uh, the most significant thing that I did there is that when you look up a single word, oftentimes you don't want a single translation, but you want to know all the different ways this could be translated. And so I was uh, leading the group that built everything that's kind of down below the main box that describes everything you could imagine about some word that you looked up. So if you type in band, you want to translate it into Chinese. Are you talking about the music band or the, you know, steel band um, or the, you know, band of brothers in a, in a war? Uh, so the idea was that even if you didn't speak Chinese, you could maybe check uh, which translation you want just by looking at how these words are translated back into the original English language. Um, and we, like, came up with some statistics about how often they're used and stuff like that. Um, but what got me really interested was uh, professional translators who do not, in general, use Google Translate because it's wrong. <laughs> and while it's very useful for many people, like, you know, 100 million people use it every month or something, uh, the professional translators found it to be um, unhelpful because it kept making the same mistakes and uh, it wasn't really integrated well into their workflow. So uh, we started a company, uh, it was actually, it's run by one of my former interns from when I was at Google, that basically is trying to do autocomplete, but for translators. So what's autocomplete? Autocomplete is when the computer tries to guess how you're finishing your sentence. So this actually exists in like a Gmail right now. If you type half a sentence, it will sometimes guess the other half. That's hard to do because they don't know what your email is about. <laughs> but in translation, it's much easier to do because we know the document that you're translating, and so we can guess the next word that a translator is going to type correctly about 80% of the time, which can speed them up and help them basically get a sense of what translation they might use. But we're very much committed to having humans be in charge of the process so that the translations actually come out right, and we're just there to kind of augment them. Um, and this, I think, is fun because it's an application of artificial intelligence. You know, we're trying to guess what a human would do. But it's not trying to replace the people. It's just trying to augment them, speed them up, uh, make them more accurate. Basically, let them not have to focus on the boring parts of translation, but they get to focus on the interesting parts. And that means that a translator can kind of get more done, uh, which can be good for them. So um, I don't actually build the software for this company. Uh, I'm there to guide a research team that does all the work. And I think that's kind of a good metaphor for my whole life, is that I'm usually there as kind of a guide uh, for a really big group of people that are all extremely talented and really, um, and really making the contributions. So I'm going to take this moment to thank all the contributors and collaborators that I've had to work with along the way. And of course, my uh, number one collaborator in my life is my wife. So I wanted to thank her in particular. This is Jessica, and she's been involved in every single thing that I've talked about today uh, and has really been an anchor for uh, my experience in, in trying to do something useful in the world. So thanks, Jessica. And thank you all for hanging out and listening to me. It's really a pleasure.
Oh, stay here. Oh, yeah, stay questions, here. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, questions. Stay in, please, yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, here, yeah. Okay. Oh, I, what I like to do like outside of computers is, I mean, I'm like carrying a computer around all the time. So um, I really like the water. Yeah, I, I go sailing a lot on San Francisco Bay and uh, we camp on the boat. Um, and then we have a stand-up paddleboard and a kayak and a dinghy and another dinghy. Yeah, so mostly boats. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, having a six-year-old is, is its own adventure. If you have questions, Elizabeth has a microphone, yeah, so please raise your hand and... Hi, good morning, thank you for the presentation. I'm just curious, looking at some of the graphs that you shared, um, with computer science in general and computing, it, it seems like it's really, really exploded maybe in the last five, five, ten years. Um, what do you think is driving that, like in the last ten years versus the prior ten? Is there, is there Anything that contributes to that? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Like, the growth has been quite steady in computing ever since the early 90s, I think. But it comes in waves and often follows the economy. So like in the first dot-com bubble, a ton of people got into computing and then there was a crash and students were like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that anymore. And then it grew again and then there was a crash and then it grew again. But each time, the dip was higher than the previous peak. So the overall trend was that it was just growing and growing and growing. I, I think this latest acceleration is now pulling in just a pretty big fraction of all the students. And that is new. Um, and uh, there, I think two things are going on. Studying computer science is really just a much better experience than it used to be. Like, it's less frustrating. It's not really about being stuck in the basement in a room with no windows trying to get, like, some inscrutable error to go away for three hours, and much more about like working with some other student uh, to solve a problem, and then you know asking questions if they get stuck so that they're not wasting their time. So that that has improved. Um, but the second part I think really is about the like relevance of computing just seems more obvious to students now than it did before because they see it not only in like playing games on their phone, but also how it's touched so many different parts of modern life. Thank you. Also, just curious, how does the grading process work in, a, in such a large class? Uh, grading is an adventure, I'll tell you. So, um, you know, it's very convenient in computer science and data science that computers can check whether somebody got something right for most cases. And so we do offload a lot of the grading onto automated systems that we've built which means it frees up a lot of student teacher time. The TAs can spend more time actually working with the students instead of grading. But we do have students like giving feedback to other students. So basically uh, grading their work as part of their teaching assistant and tutor roles. And um, yeah, that's not their favorite part of teaching, but it's sort of necessary. Uh, I think that's probably true of a lot of teachers is that grading is not the best part, but it, it, the whole package is worth it. Just curious, is, is at your level, how much time, if any, do you spend actually in the classroom teaching? Uh, good question. I do give lots of lectures. Um, and so that means, like right now I'm teaching two classes. They each have three hours of lecture a week. But I have co-instructors for both of them. So you put that all together. And I'm probably in the lecture hall four hours a week. Um, and then working with students directly another four hours a week. And then the rest of it is just teaching the teaching assistants, building assignments, wrangling faculty to make policy changes, uh, a little bit of research, that kind of stuff. We have one in the back, but also if you're out there online in the virtual world, I'm told we have these things called computers. So if you submit a question. Now so, uh, being... Some writers have raised the question whether the social media algorithms are exacerbating levels of resentment and rage uh, among people who participate in social media. Since you teach on ethics 
and the social impact of data sciences. I'm wondering if you see that happening, and if so, what can we do about it? Yeah, great question. I think that uh, social networks grew organically and without a lot of control. There was some forethought, but there was no expectation that they would have the impact on society that they have now had. So I, I don't think even the people building these systems saw it coming. And now we're at the point where we need to address some of the effects of social networks on society without building them from scratch, because it's really hard to get rid of the ones that are there, and it's really hard to build new ones. So, yeah, lots of students and myself are, and lots of faculty are interested in coming up with like more socially responsible versions of social networks. Um, that's sort of a grand challenge in the field of the social implications of computing, is how can we design the incentives and the systems so that uh, productive discourse happens and uh, people learn accurate information as opposed to what often happens, which is that there's sort of information siloing, people only talk to people that, only, that already agree with them, and then there's a lot of misinformation. Um, it's going to be hard to solve these problems because there's a lot of people interested in keeping things the way they are, but there's also a lot of people trying to figure out how to fix it. Um, and I don't, I don't expect that there will be a quick fix, but I do expect that a lot of attention is going to be paid to this over, over time. Thank you so much for what you do. I, I know you say you're a guy, but I see you as a visionary, and I think that's a whole new subject to be teaching to, to others, to young people. But I feel curious about an artistic expression for all these students, you have hundreds and hundreds of students. And I know when we teach people to weld, they can also go artistically and sculpt um, with their welding capabilities. So you're teaching them this computer data I love that question. Maybe, maybe I'll be so bold as to, well, it's probably too much of a risk to try to figure it out. But I'll just tell you that um, we run an art generation contest at the end of every computer science course. And part of that is to make sure that students who really uh, have a need for artistic expression, have an outlet for it, and also to just show that it's value, that like uh, using computers to create like some cool uh, computer generated art is a great way to apply what you've learned. And I was gonna show you some of the things that they've generated, because it's totally amazing, but uh, yeah, maybe not right now. Um, you want me to try? Okay, well, here it goes. Anything could happen. <laughs> This is not my computer, so it might be a little slow. Uh, well, that's so small. <laughs> uh, I've been running that recursive art contest since 2011, I think. Uh, I just like picking a random year, and let's see if we can find the gallery. Here is the stuff that they write. So we have a version where they have to write a really short program that generates art. And uh, here are some things that they generated. Uh, about each one of them, they get to write a haiku. Uh, so that's what the caption is. And uh, yeah, someone tried to win just by writing a circle. Um, and then we have a second division where they can write a longer program. Well, there's a lot of people that enter. Okay, so let's see if I can skip ahead. And here, this is like a symbol of Cal beating Berkeley, or uh, Cal beating Stanford. Uh, <laughs> this person did not actually fail, 61A. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I guess that's a picture of me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but sometimes they come up with really beautiful stuff. So uh, the idea is like use something that they've learned in the course in order to build something new, um, and lots of people do it. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, so the impact of everybody having a computer in their pocket is pretty profound. Um, it's, there are definitely negative implications. And you point to one, that it can be harder to have interpersonal communication live when all these devices are around. And, and the folks who dream up a, a world in which the devices are helping people talk to each other when they're sitting around the dinner table are probably working on the wrong problem, right? Like uh, sitting around the dinner table is sort of already a solved problem, doesn't need a lot of computers. <laughs> at, the, at the same time, I think the, the positive transformations from everybody having a computer in their pocket have been pretty dramatic. You know, the fact that you can never get lost when you're driving anymore, um, the way in which it's enabled payments in different parts of the world where, you know, it was harder to, um, to pay for things once upon a time. You know, some, in some places in the world, your phone is basically your bank account. Um, and then the connections and access to information. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to understate how much that has changed the human experience in a positive way, and it's the reason why people are so reluctant to give up their phones, is because they really do kind of augment you in interesting ways. But the downsides are very real. Like, and it's not just the conversations, it's also you know, people's ability to kind of see the world around them and not always be paying attention to what's on their phone. Um, and also, the information that they get is not always helpful, especially when social networks are pushing information that, um, yeah, that affects people or misinforms them. Um, so, th yeah, it, it's really interesting to have something that's sort of good and bad at the same time, but the good is good enough that it's hard to imagine a world in which we'd all throw these away. And so it seems like now we're in a place where we need to try to address the problems one at a time, because the whole technology is here to stay. That's what I think. They were just talking this week about uh, giving AI emotions on NPR radio. Uh, what would be the purpose for that? Uh, good question. So giving AI emotions. I think that um, artificial intelligence it was originally about replicating what humans do, which is that we can basically solve a lot of different problems and deal with a lot of different situations. But that field has evolved dramatically to be more of an engineering discipline in that it's about solving particular problems. So I point to Google Translate as an example. It doesn't work like a human. It doesn't understand language like a human. It's really just there as a tool to help people in their lives. And so uh, a lot of work in artificial intelligence looks like this. Self-driving cars. Uh, you can talk to your phone and ask it questions. All these systems are basically um, problem-oriented or purpose-oriented. And there are actually reasons or like problems that you would want to solve that involve human emotion. They usually involve like trying to provide companionship for people who don't, haven't been able to find it through regular society. Or they're trying to build trust with the users so that they can take advantage of the technology. But these motivations are not that strong, right? So I, I think most people who are working in artificial intelligence are not working on trying to make emotions exist in their systems. Instead, they're just trying to make the systems useful for people directly. Like self-driving car needs to not run into pedestrians more than it needs to have emotions. So that's where most of the people are focused. But there are particular reasons that people can come up with for saying like, oh, in order to solve this problem, uh, having some, some sense of the user's emotion and being able to express emotion might make the system more useful. I think that's what's going on. But it's more of a perception from the human about what emotions are there as opposed to real emotions in the machine. I don't think that that's something that anyone's really directly working on.
Yeah, yeah, great question. So security is about um, protecting information, um, secure communication so that, uh, yeah, so that one computer can talk to another computer without that information being uh, read. But also it's about making sure that an untrusted person out there can't change what's going on inside of a computer program, so can't edit the balance of your bank account. Um, the biggest change I've seen is that computer security used to be an elective course that you know some small fraction of all computer science majors would take. Now it's an election, uh, elected course that almost all computer science majors take, and students who are not majoring in computer science are quite interested in it too. It's become much more core to the discipline, and that's because it has so many more implications today, because so much of our lives is entwined with computers and so if those systems aren't secure, then that really affects society quite dramatically. So this has always been a subfield of computer science, but it wasn't so central before. And now I think you can't really be ready to build software applications in the world unless you understand computer security. It's become kind of a fundamental in that way. Still really hard to get right. So there's, you see like every day you can read about a security breach um, there's lots of people trying to find flaws in computer security systems, and they are quite hard to get right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make it cool yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting you ask that question. Like, what's the role of high school if this is what's going on in college? Um, a lot of the effort has been about getting people interested in computer science while they're in high school or middle school or lower school. My perspective is that for students coming to Berkeley, that's not quite so necessary. They tend to get excited about it and fall into it while they're there because there's just so much energy there. So some exposure is great, but it's actually um, only part of what a high school needs to do. I think a high school also needs to set people up so that when they start investing a lot of energy into computer science or data science, they're successful at it, they're comfortable at it, they don't get frustrated. Um, math fundamentals, really helpful there. Um, you know, being able to write, really helpful there. So, you know, the core curriculum that Blake's been good at for a long time, I think actually does set students up to get excited about computer science when they arrive. But, you know, there are students who get excited about it when they're 12 and they make incredible impact. And so having that option in a high school or a middle school is a great idea. But I don't think it should be the burden of a high school or middle school to get every student excited about computer science or data science. Just set them up so that if they do get excited about it later, they can really succeed. We have time for just one more question. So I just wanted to build on what you just said and talk about um, what your experience at Blake has been, what teachers made the most impact to put you on your current success in your computer science career. And um, as you know, math has been a tremendous department here at Blake on Parallel, so it would be helpful to know how your profession started here. Oh, um, yeah, well, uh, um, Paul Vetcher's here, and <laughs> certainly can't thank you enough for getting me excited about math. Um, I, I got excited about math in middle school. Uh, it was in uh, Judy and Ehrlich ran a, a math counts program. And um, yeah, a, a lot of my friends were there. Some of them are still here. It's pretty great. Um, and um, yeah, and it was actually the co-curricular part as opposed to the courses that made a big difference for me at Blake. So having the like extracurricular program where we kept playing with math um, after hours, I, I think got me the most excited. And uh, yeah, hopefully that's still going on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay.
it's just amazing. And I want to thank you again, John, for taking time to be with us this morning. Thank all of you for being us here uh, this morning. It's a great reminder that the words you say from a stage may be captioned and come back 24 years later. <laughs> what I'll take from this is that grading is an adventure and conversations around the dinner table or here at breakfast, it's a problem that's been solved. It's been <laughs> an honor having you here and to be a presenter for our Breakfast at Blake series. I hope to see you all. Um, on Thursday, January 12th, for Breakfast at Blake featuring Dr. Benjamin Sun. Dr. Sun is the proud father of Brandon, class of 19, Melanie, class of 21, as well as a current Blake Jr., Matthew, in the class of 24. He's a cardiothoracic surgery specialist in the surgical director of heart failure at Alina Health in Minneapolis, which is a mouthful. Among other things, he will discuss heart in the box therapy, which is a promising innovation that is expected to provide hope for the 3,400 plus patients who are awaiting heart transplants here in the United States. Be well, stay in touch, and on behalf of the Blake Alumni Association, thank you again for participating today.